architecture is really the art and science of turning fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. Hello, this is Vikram Prakash and you are listening to Architecture Talk. Each episode, we have a conversation with a contemporary thinker on issues of architecture and architectural thinking. What we're interested in is what architecture has been, what it is today, and most importantly, what it might be, what it could be in the future. Uh, We are interested in advancing the frontiers of architectural thinking. And in that regard, uh, I am very excited to have here with me today, uh, my old friend, Jorge Otero Pylos. Welcome to Architecture Talk, Jorge. And I think the major topic that we are going to talk about today is or are the, what should I call them, installation works that you have done at various sites, mostly in Europe, whereby you create these uh, latex casts of pollution that has accumulated on buildings using the techniques that are used by preservationists to clean these objects. But beyond just cleaning these objects, you take these casts and situate them in the sites where they have just finished doing their work as displays as and i'm looking at uh, uh photographs of your various uh, installations i see that you did one in uh, at the doge's palace in venice uh, another one with the trajan's column in in london another one with uh, at the louis vuitton factory i guess it was originally in paris and most recently at westminster hall and i'm looking at these pictures Uh, And what I see are these fantastic, huge, mostly huge, luminescent panels of golden yellow. Uh, And there's this idea with light shining behind and through them that somehow as illuminated objects displaying pollution, they are trying to convey something about that pollution. So I might ask, uh, what what is it about pollution and illuminating in this way that interests you? Um, Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, It's really a pleasure to be on. And uh, I would say that the the work about um, the ethics of dust is the name of the series of works cleaning um, that that result from the cleaning of, of monuments around the world. It's a work that is asking us to really think about what is this layer of, of dust that settles on top of buildings and where it comes from mm-hmm. um, and why do we clean it? I mean, we, we, um, we're so used to cleaning buildings and to seeing buildings being cleaned and to celebrate that as, as something good. And I just, you know, many years ago started thinking about what, what, do we, what are we really doing when we're cleaning a building? What is really right. happening culturally when we are cleaning a building? And um, certainly there's an idea of care. There's an idea of our duty of care to these monuments. And they're very special buildings that get, you know, this kind of treatment. Uh, They're buildings that we as a society have selected to be, um, to represent our culture Mm -hmm. and and buildings that we keep coming back to for meaning about our culture. And so when we, when we clean them, we're, we're trying to take care of them, but something else was going on. It seemed to me that, we also felt that something didn't belong on those buildings. You know, mm-hmm. when we needed to remove it. And the fact that, that pollution didn't belong, that, that it's this layer that we, we feel doesn't belong to the buildings, to me uh, was just a, a source of wonder. And so right. even if I, uh, you know, there's so much pressure to, to clean the buildings and as preservationists that we are engaged, that's a major part of preservation practice to clean buildings uh 
But I, I didn't want to just uh, get rid of the, the pollution and the dust on, on the surfaces of buildings. I wanted to, to ponder them a little bit and, so, uh, and to invite other people's thinking about it. So, so in, the, in, in, in a sense, uh, which, it, in which direction is the sort of uh, pondering that you are situating? Is it in the direction of why do preservationists clean and what is it to clean? Uh, or is it in the direction of why do we not consider pollution as part of the histor uh, historic identity of the object? Or is it both? Yeah, a, a bit both. Um, you know, I was very interested and, in, uh, you know, I, I must say that I didn't begin this work with a very sort of set idea of, you know, what this, what it meant. Right. I began doing the work and then the work has helped me see different things and, and open up different questions, which I've then gone on to, to research, mm -hmm. uh, which, which is what makes the work interesting for me. In other words, it's not a kind of path determined thing where, uh, you know, uh, you, you know, the answer before you do it. In fact, the, sure, sure. part of it has been to open up questions about, uh, about the very practice of it. But I guess to go back to your question, I, the fundamental thing in this is, trying to figure out where a building ends, really. You know, where does a building end? Uh, uh -huh. It's a question that a lot of people are asking today when they're talking about uh, buildings in terms of materials and the fact that, you know, buildings come from somewhere. They come from, they're sourced from quarries or from mines or, you know, from forests, and then they have a lifespan, and then they're, they either go back to the earth or they are disassembled. And one of the mm -hmm. things that very few people talk about in that discourse is the actual pollution that buildings generate. You know, we talk about embodied energy mm -hmm. and CO2 mm -hmm. and so on. But, you no, know, every building has a boiler uh, that, and especially in the 19th century, those were burning coal and they were producing a lot of particulate matter. Right. Buildings continue to do that today. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, if we think of the building as a, as a material process, you know, why is, is the pollution that is coming out of the building not considered part of the building? That, to me, was, was a big question because is that very pollution that is coming out of the building that's settling on to it first? And, of course, then the rest of it is coming from, from the atmosphere. Right. So um, it's really, you know, that question of why, why is this not part of the building? And of, of course, if you think of the word pollution, pollution literally means that that which has no place in culture. Uh, if you think of Mary Douglas's work on pollution and taboo. So um, that for me, once I began to realize that it was it was it became a cultural conversation for me because I realized that. You know, what we were talking about when we are actually caring for these cultural monuments is for a definition of culture. And that is what's at stake in these buildings. And so the fact that we, um, we all agree that something doesn't belong on that building is, is somehow indicative of a shared idea of what is in and what is out of culture. And the fact that pollution stood out and in a type of, you know, unquestioned uh, and unexamined way, to me was very important, especially in the age of the Anthropocene, uh, when we realize that the pollution is one of our most important products. Right, right. That, right. That, that the pollution that we've made is actually changing the environment to such a degree that um, it is unlike anything that we've ever had before in the history of the planet. Right. We are, we, we, that it's that pollution that is our, our greatest contribution to, to the planet, not just the buildings. You know. So that to me was very important as a realization. So how do we then engage and ponder that contribution as an architectural contribution, as an artistic contribution that we as a culture are making? And that's why I decided to start just, first of all, just hanging them you know, hanging these sheets of latex. Um, when, I, when I clean the buildings, I paint them with latex and it's a specialized form of latex that then when I remove it, all the, all the pollution comes off with the latex mm -hmm. and it creates these large sheets. So then, you know, when I hang these sheets in front of the very wall where they are 
coming from, then you can see the relationship between the clean wall and the and the pollution. So, so, the, so the technique that you are using is that the standard technique for uh, cleaning uh, important surface, like the kind that you are using, or are you, or is this a specialized technique that you have developed? It's a specialized technique. I haven't developed it. I mean, you could say that it's a very old technique in many ways. People used to use mud, for example, that they would put up against the building to keep moisture up against the surface of the building to soften that surface so that they would be able to clean it more easily. They used paper mache uh, with a little bit of soap in it. So this is really changing the vehicle only, but not so much the, the method. I mean, the, the vehicle here is latex as opposed to paper mache or mud. But what the latex does is that it maintains a level of moisture up against the surface of the, of the building enough to release the very surface. And it has a little bit of cleaning agent in it that separates that surface. And then as the latex dries, because it dries from the outside first so that the part of it that's in contact with the surface remains wet, it, the, the moisture in the, in the latex is moving out from the wall. So it's actually drawing in, it's literally sucking out the pollution. I see. Uh, and then it becomes embedded in the, in, the, in the latex. So it works very well, but it's a light cleaning. Now, there's no standard way of cleaning a building. You know, people use pressure washers, for example, which is a terrible thing to use because it, it removes part of the surface of the building. It, it really is very abrasive. And, and sometimes they even use different kinds of, um, you know, sand uh, under pressure or, you know, other materials. So this is a very light way of cleaning. Really, the idea is here to just remove the dust from the surface of the building. Right. So, but then after you have done this light cleaning, as you said, right. you put up these displays and you illuminate them. And that gives to them this quality of, of, of disclosure as if, you know, they are trying to communicate and say something, Correct as I look at the images, and I actually did see your uh, display at the VNA, they I can see how they would count as works of art or as critical commentaries, as critical installation artworks. But your training is entirely in architecture. Would you articulate this as as architecture or art? Well, you know, um, I think it's both. I think it's both. How, how is it architecture? I think it's architecture in the sense that it is quite literally a piece of a building. So it would be hard not to think of it as architecture. Right. Uh, if I were to have removed a brick from the building, we would consider it architecture. You could make also other things out of it. But, you know, I think that I think very much of that pollution as part of the building. Now, mm -hmm. I guess you could argue that it isn't. And I was very curious. I mean, one of the first works I did was at the Doge's Palace for many reasons, but one of them being that that's the, one of the first places where there was a major debate right next door at, at St. Mark's Basilica about whether dust was part of a building or not. I see. And, uh, you know, that's where John Ruskin wrote the famous book on the Stones of Venice and talked about how he called that dust a time stain and said, you know, it's really integral to the architecture. And then, you know, there was uh, Meduno was uh, doing a restoration and replacing some of those pieces of the of St. Mark's Basilica with new pieces of, of marble. And it was a big international uh, brouhaha about what he was doing. The British uh, Society for the Preservation of Ancient Buildings got involved, and it was um, a tremendous international debate about whether dust belonged or didn't belong to the building. And Camilo Boito famously went up to the building with a white handkerchief and spit on it, and then rubbed it on the building and said, you see, this is soot. Like, this is mm -hmm. not architecture. And so I, I've been very interested in that because how can we say that, that it's not part of, sure. part of the building? 
what is the question you are asking of the discipline of historic preservation of architecture? That one is to critique the work of cleaning of buildings, which is part of the job of preservation. Other is to say, well, this throws up questions about what is critical preservation? Yes, I mean, do you, are you developing a theory based on your work on what a contemporary critical historic preservation practice might start becoming? I, yes, and together with a lot of other practitioners who are using historic objects to try to think about where contemporary culture and contemporary society is going and the uses we make of historic buildings in, in this transition, you know, we, we are thinking about this as experimental preservation. And a, one of the fundamental things about that, that practice of experimental preservation is not to take cultural objects as givens. You know, mm-hmm. often preservation is thought of as something that receives cultural objects. The cultural objects are there, they exist, they are given to preservationists to take care of them. I see. And in fact, you know, experimental preservationists, um, through their work, are showing that actually preservationists make the objects in the act of preserving them. Obviously, we recognize that all acts of preservation are a kind of editing, but you are talking about preservation as making the object. What do you mean by that? It's a very, it's a very particular kind of making that I'm talking about as a very, a very particular kind of creativity, which involves, first of all, the choosing of an existing object. And that that is, first of all, a very creative act. And in that creative act, you are constituting an object. Uh, But that object is absolutely not your creation. It's what I would call a not me creation. So to give you an example that maybe most people would be familiar with, you know, we're all familiar with historic districts in our cities. Right. Uh, Well, a historic district never existed there Mm -hmm. until a preservationist came, drew a line, made an argument, and convinced everyone that there is such a thing as a historic district that requires extra regulation, investment of capital and emotional resources, and so on and so forth. Now, you could say, but those buildings were always there, and indeed they were. But in fact, they were never constituted as, an, as a coherent object that is recognizable by, you know, as a cultural artifact by the broader public, and that draws the public interest until a preservationist produced it. Right. Right. And so and and that is true of every single monument and historic building and historic landscape that we we recognize uh, as such. And so in some way you could argue that this has always been going on, but what has shifted is our ability to understand that process and to take it to the next level. Right. And indeed in one sense one can say that a a, a critically informed architectural design practice in that sense, even if it's constructing something new on site, should imagine itself as in some ways a critical preservation practice because they are making and uh, defining a character to a place. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Now, I think that I think preservation has a lot to offer and to contribute to contemporary design. Because once you take what you just put out there as, uh, as a sort of starting point for design and, and, to, and to think of yours, your work as the choosing of an existing reality and something that you're going to transform, the idea is not to change it. The idea is to sustain it and to help it do what it cannot do on its own. In other words, to supplement it in the right way which is very different than to, to alter it or reuse it or transform it because it places the object first as opposed to you first. Right. You know, when you talk about adaptive reuse and you talk about all you know, that sort of transformational work, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you're talking about what can this object do for me? And, how, and actually, I don't want to change what I'm doing. 
So right. how can I how can I bend this object to do what what I'm already doing? Yeah, anthropocentrism. Yes, exactly. So it's a very anthropocentric point of view. So mm-hmm. what, what experimental preservationists are trying to advance is the idea that what if we what if we let the object be, and that that is the the creative act? How will it en- enrich our lives to do that? Right, and how do we sort of learn to live with the object rather than the other one. So this would be might be a good point for us to take a little break. Hello, this is Vikram Prakash, and you are listening to Architecture Talk, and we are having a conversation with Professor Jorge Otero Pilos, and we are beginning to talk about how a preservation practice informs thinking about architecture and architectural thinking itself, and what are the crossovers between those two things. So, you know, perhaps one way I might provoke that question is to ask Ask what your thoughts are on, uh, you know, Rem Kulhas's famous statement that preservation is overtaking us. I mean, I have a sense that when he talks about it, his concern is that, in a sense, preservation is the only critical discourse that seems to be left standing in the wake of architectural thinking's inability to cope up with our times. But I wonder how you think, what do you think about that statement? Well, I think it was a very interesting and important statement that uh, Rem made uh, when he began to actually change the, the discourse uh, by recognizing the importance of preservation as a, as a creative discipline and by turning to it and, and uh, trying to learn from it. And fundamentally, I think it, you know, he was referring to the idea that preservationists might be preserving the future and not only the past. That it used to be that preservationists were preserving very old things and then they preserved things that were created within people's lifetime. And then he was suggesting, well, maybe they're going to be preserving things that are yet to have appeared. Unpack that for me. What do you mean preserving the future? How is that possible? Well, I think that in, if I may, you know, put Rem's comments aside for the moment, yes, yes. because I don't want to psychoanalyze them, but I will tell you what I think. We can that, turn to psychoanalysis in a minute. <laughs> uh, I, I, I can tell you what I think that means. I think preservation is always leaping over the present and into the future. If you think of the preservation of an object, what you are, what you are doing is, in a sense, making a choice that this object in particular and not others is going to be around tomorrow. Right. And you're going to do everything you can in order to do that, to that for that thing to stay around tomorrow. You're going to, you're going to ensure it. Mm-hmm. Now, objects don't stick around. For the most part, they disaggregate, they, they fall apart. They are, whether by mechanical means, by the weather or whatever, they are not around. Right, right. So it takes an enormous amount of energy to do that. Right, right. And so when we preserve, we're, we're investing an enormous amount of energy, psychological, financial, cultural, to ensure that that object is around tomorrow. And not just tomorrow, maybe 50 years, 100 years, 500 years from now. So in fact, we're always leaping over the present. Uh, and into the future when we are, you know, making the choice to preserve something. I know you're the editor of uh, the one of the most, probably the leading journal in historic preservation. Uh, what, what is, the, and it's called uh, Future Anterior. W- would you take a moment to explain that title to us in the context of preservation? Well, Future Anterior is really a tense, a verb tense, and, and you can imagine it as... Uh, a, temp- a, a sort of impossible temporality uh, 
where you would be projecting yourself way into the future and then looking back at the future from that point of view or at, at what our future to uh, our futures today would look like from that further point of view in the future so that what will have been the tense of what will have been what will have been yes. exactly which is a very difficult thing but if you think about it when we're talking about the idea of of a, of an object living into the future we can do everything we want technologically to do that it will not i mean we're talking about somebody else taking care of that object there is no technology that on its own is going to take care of an object uh for millions and you know for thousands of years maybe pyramids were the only one you know pyramids are like a, a great preservation technology device for a sarcophagus right 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 i mean they're insane objects when you think about it there's four thousand years later and it's still a vault that still exists when it one would have thought it would have disappeared spectacularly by now Correct. But the uh, trick of, uh, of a pyramid is that it's not meant for human use, the inside, right? That object inside is not meant for other generations to actually engage in. Right. The, the, the actual object is the sarcophagus, we must remember, not the pyramid. The pyramid is just a supplement for the sarcophagus. Right. Correct. It's the preservation supplement for the sarcophagus. Mm -hmm. We have a very different relationship to objects today, and we the objects we want are objects that we can engage with and use for our purposes. And so the question is, what are our purposes? You know, what are our purposes? And, and how will people down the line, how will future generations that are yet unborn care for those objects? That's the way we've been thinking about preservation. But in fact, we don't know what those unborn generations are going to care for. Mm -hmm. And maybe that is actually not the point at all of preservation but rather what are those what are what, how what is our relationship to those objects today why are we attracted to those objects today or how are we what is our investment in an uncertain future i mean when we preserve something like you said we are working with the assumption that future generation and future times will continue to do the work of preserving the object Whereas the future is defined by the fact that we don't know what is going to happen. So therefore, to preserve today, preserve a past today with a view to a future, makes a bet on the future. But at the same time, I think it's very important what you just said, that it recognizes that the future, we don't know what it's going to be. Secondly, the future is a very scary thing precisely because we don't know what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very interested in that, that transitioning into the future is actually something that is the source of a great deal of anxiety, cultural anxiety, uh, personal anxiety, and that we, de we have developed coping mechanisms for figuring out a way that we can collectively deal with such stressful uh, transitions. And so if you think of objects like uh, historic monuments, historic buildings, as actually a really important class of cultural objects whose purpose is to help us in transitioning into the future, that's quite different than the idea that these cultural objects are something that we are gifting to the future. The future doesn't want our gifts. Right. You know, look at the gifts we're leaving in the future. We're leaving uh, pollution and all these sorts of, you know, really, you know, terrible environmental world to to the future. That, I mean, the future could use different kinds of gifts, quite frankly, but that's not what we do. We don't want to burden the future with gifts like of this sort. Preservation, the kinds of objects that not me creations that that we make as preservationists are, are serve a much more present need which is to help us as a society deal with the anxieties and pressures uh, and fears of transitioning into the future. Well, I think that that's true. I mean, because 
uh, we live in much more uncertain times. I, if I if I was to do a short history of preservation, and we don't want to get into a full full history, but let's say preservation begins in the 19th century, sometime as the antidote to the utopian present of modernism, the idea that we are going to live in an eternal present, uh, a sort of utopian present in which everything will have been figured out. In that context, what is it of the past that we must preserve? Thus, the gaps between a modernist structure and the preservation object that is belongs to a history. But that old 19th and early, I suppose, 20th century idea in which we assumed we were advancing into a, 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 a secularized Eden is, uh, of course, no longer in play. Now it seems not only is our past a kind of an uncertain thing, but certainly our next few years, uh, forget about the next few decades or the next century, are extremely uh, under question. Hmm. So would you would you say that this distinction has come into being where preservation earlier was much more about a greater sense of certainty about the present in which therefore the past could be bracketed and framed in a certain way, whereas today the present is much more uncertain, therefore our relationship to the past is doubly uncertain. I, I actually, uh, I don't agree fully what you just said. I think the, pr the future has always been uncertain. And what you do see in the 19th century is the feeling of the future, the changes that happen in, in culture happening a lot faster. So the inability to cope with change, you know, the, 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 uh, due to the rapidity of it, is part of the experience of modernity. Right. Um, it's not so much about industrialization and a sort of, te you know, you know the, the, but it is, of course, part of it. And, but you have different responses to it. And I think that what we had in, you know, in the late 19th and certainly in the early 20th century and even up until very recently was this sense that the way you cope with the, with the future is to invent it. You know, the way you cope with the future is actually to foreclose on it. Yes, yes. Which is what design theoretically does, that we, we invent and make working drawings for things to know how the future is exactly going to be made and look. Exactly, exactly. So you, so you, have, you have this idea of um, projection of, of, of a future in order to, to quell the anxiety of the future, to say, no, we right. actually know what the future is going to be. And in fact, to foreclose on this notion of the, you know, on the, on the very vulnerability that, that exposing oneself to the lack of knowledge about the future and its consequences for us will be. So, and that has led to, to a very strange mode of responding to, to our environment, which is to dominate it. Right, absolutely. And to, and to transform it in the image of what, it, what we think it should be, which always is wrong, you know, because we all keep getting, you know, we keep imposing images of what, of, of fear in the, into the future. So in fact, you know, when I look at these images of, you know, uh, the modernists and so on, what uh, I see are images of, of anxiety about other kinds of futures and an attempt to really exclude those possibilities by, by, by determining, a type, you know, designing a type of future. I get it. Putting those objects in there. So, what I think is we've moved into a different reality now, and that's where I think preservation is so exciting, which is to say, okay, what are other ways in which architecture can help us transition into the future that don't necessarily involve fully inventing it mm -hmm. in the sense of foreclosing upon it? How do we leave the future open? Mm -hmm. For ourselves and for future generations, and, and and how do we come to cope with the world around us? So, like from experience, we know that the future is going to involve having pieces of the past, because when we look around ourselves, we see things that were built way before we existed. So we know that to be true. We also know that those things wouldn't be there unless people had invested themselves in them, 
and maintain them and preserve them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we know that to be true. So, so we know that at least certain aspects of our reality will remain in the future. And those are called landmarks, literally things that we use to measure an unknown territory. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's what we do when we create, you know, not me creations, is that we are proposing landmarks that we know are going to exist in the unknown territory of the future. And it is from those landmarks that we can measure and assess and, and imagine what an open-ended future might be. So uh, it seems to me what you are describing is not is reasonably close to the distinction that Derrida makes between future and l'avenir, yes? Uh, mm. Where he says... Uh, the future is the, you know, sort of simple future where the future is, you know, uh, you know, I'm going to wake up and go to work tomorrow and, you know, some things will predictably be happen. But uh, l'avenir is, he says, that which will happen tomorrow, which I know will happen, but which I cannot in any way anticipate today. Right. Literally, that which that which will come to you. So that in the sense that it is the known about the future that that will happen, what that will be will not, cannot be known today. So how do we prepare for that coming is, he says, a project that he is interested in uh, as the lavenir. Well, I mean, I, I, there's some relationship in, in my work to that, but um, I would say that there's another factor that also is is part of this, which is, uh, it goes back to your raising of the question of modernism as an expression of modernity. And what it did was to make the claim that in order to control the future, you had to have a radical break. Right, right, right. That was its coping mechanism. It was its coping mechanism. To, and, and in fact, there was, there was a degree of truth in that, in the sense that we know that life is actually a series of radically disjointed moments. It's an Oedipal strategy, right? Isn't it? That uh, you sort of decapitate uh, your, uh, your father? Yeah, in some way. But explain to me what you mean by that. The way to deal with castration anxiety is to do, perform an imaginary disconnection between yourself and the father above. And so that's Oedipus. That's the Oedipal strategy. So you make a massive demonstration of breaking from your father, which of course only discloses how you are doubly indebted to him, but at a more subconscious, unconscious level. Right. So that's how I, I was suggesting that one could read modernism's big demonstration of break with the past and the persistence of the groove and the gap in all of architecture between modern modernist work and pre-modernist work as the sign of this decapitation. Well, I suppose, I mean, I, I would read it to just play that back to you slightly. The, the, what it does is disclose who the father is, right? If you don't know who it is, you, you, you disclose, that action discloses who the father is. And, right. and the father, in the, in the case of modernism, if you were to sort of follow your logic, mm. would be radical discontinuity. Right. I mean, that that, that is part and parcel of the experience of, of modernity or, as, or, or one of the things that in the speed of change, we recognize that there are these radical discontinuities. And then, so what do we do in that uh, reality. And I think you're right that that is why preservation becomes really central, which is figuring out a way and or many ways, you know, how do we then begin to reconstruct a sense of continuity within within this rupture? Right. How can we, so to speak, learn to live with our inevitable fathers in a way that doesn't have to make a massive public de declaration of decapitation and autogenesis, right? I mean, so how can we live both with our fathers and with our sons, since we are going to stick to the male logic over here, who are our future and our unknown future, but we know in a certain way will be there. Right. So, you know, in, in, for me, 
If I may bracket that for a moment, what I think is really interesting, at least for me in terms of all of this, and maybe different than the Oedipal paradigm that you presented, is that there's no objects in the Oedipal paradigm. There's no objects that ne- negotiate or help to make these, um, these changes, right? Well, architecture is the fetishistic transference of psychoanalytic uh, desire. Making of things is to... What's the murder weapon? Yes, it's the murder weapon, yes. yes. But there are other, I mean, that, that's to put it in a, in, a, in a sort of negative way, mm-hmm. right? To say that it is something that is actually the, 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 the vehicle of, of rupture and of, and of negation. But what if actually it was the other way around? What if architecture is actually the vehicle for us to construct other forms of continuity Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. to cope with other kinds of ruptures? And that's where I think if you look at monuments and you look at the kinds of objects that preservationists have produced, they're objects that in fact help to stabilize and give a kind of experiential continuity, you know, for culture. Mm Mm-hmm. However, artificially, there are places that you can go back to that are the same. Right. Even though everything else has changed. Right. And uh, it's absolutely an artificial thing, but what it does is that it helps to create the illusion of continuity. Yeah. I mean, in the sense, it recognizes that it's not just you and your dad. There's family, there's society, there's culture, there's a larger textile of life and history that's beyond yourself, uh, which, which you can hold on to and which holds you, rather. Exactly. That, that's your world. Yeah. That's the social fabric of the world. Mm-hmm. But that, that social fabric of the world is not something that you can necessarily ask about, you know, directly. You don't know what your world is like. You don't know, you know, so, th- so, so these objects allow you to begin to explore that world and to see whether other people, you know, to, to see an experience, whether other people share your, share your sense of uh, having experienced continuity or recognizing a form of continuity in those objects. Mm-hmm. So objects become kind of uh, mediate, not mediators, but sort of uh, the textile or the weave we are which one can sense the presence of others. That's right. And the, 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 that, that, that enable a certain kind of social game we call culture. Right. And in some ways, you know, uh, all preservation works are also a discourse of cultural essentialization. And I think uh, your work begins to critique that in interesting ways. Well, it's been great talking to you, Jorge. Thank you for being on Architecture Talk. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to Architecture Talk. I'm Vikram Prakash, and our show's producer is Sadie Vechler. See you next time. Mm-hmm.